I'm Rob Spinner. I'm one of the peripheral nerve surgeons at the Mayo Clinic in the Department of Neurosurgery. Today we're going to be talking about brachial plexus injuries in adults. Uh, the brachial plexus is a network of nerves that joins the spinal cord and the arm. Uh, there are five nerves in the brachial plexus in the neck region. Injuries here usually occur from high-speed trauma, but they can be from lower energy things like falls, etc. Uh, the high-speed injuries can be devastating. Typically, immediately after an injury, a patient will have a deficit, meaning that their arm or part of the arm will be paralyzed and they'll have loss of sensation in that limb. In a complete injury, they may have complete loss of function in that arm. So, for example, they may have what's called a flail limb where their shoulder, elbow, and hand don't work. In that same complete injury, for example, the hand may have no sensation whatsoever. In incomplete lesions or partial injuries, the uh, mechanism may be different such that part of the limb may be affected, such as the shoulder may not move in uh, abduction, so moving at the side, for example, or the elbow may not flex. Those are the most common patterns, either a complete loss or an incomplete where the shoulder and the elbow bending are affected. Uh, really the main uh, form of investigation is to figure out whether or not surgery is necessary. Typically patients are followed for several months for closed injuries uh, and at that time a decision is made whether or not they're improving based on clinical examination and tests such as EMG. In other cases where the mechanism is uh, higher velocity or the injury is severe, an additional test may be a myelogram or a CT myelogram or even an MRI scan, which is looking to see whether or not the nerves have been uh, avulsed or ripped from the spinal cord itself. Those injuries uh, are not directly reparable. There are some ways of substituting function for them, but typically they wouldn't recover spontaneously. So the whole decision then is, number one, is whether or not surgery is indicated, and then secondly, when should surgery be done, and then third, what type of surgery can be offered. And I think all of those are interrelated. Most people are thinking about surgical intervention between two and six months on the nerve if there's been no recovery two months perhaps for injuries where they've been ripped out of the spinal cord and there's a little if any indication that there might be some spontaneous recovery. Uh, the six months whether or not there may be some chance for recovery and in those cases maybe there has been some slight improvement but not enough. But I think that's a good time frame for closed injuries, two to six months on average for the nerve. Now, nerves recover very slowly, so in fact they grow an inch a month. So that's why some people are, have a tendency to wait beyond the six months to see whether or not there is recovery. However, one has to be careful because if you wait long enough beyond that six-month window, then the results from surgery go down in almost every series. So really, you like to make a decision before six months if possible. Different surgeries are available for patients depending on the time of the injury and depending on what type of injury and the severity of it. But in general, one would explore the brachial plexus, meaning one would look at the zone of the injury and then with some type of intraoperative monitoring make a decision whether or not there in fact has been or is any recovery. If there is recovery present, then one would do what's called a neurolysis, which means one would just free up the nerves and would the monitoring prognosticate that that injury would recover. That's seldomly the case. In most uh, examples, the injury has been so severe that the nerves have either been ruptured, avulsed, or stretched to, to a point where they won't recover. In that case, then if it's connected to the spinal cord, if the nerves are connected to the spinal cord, then nerve grafts can be done. And nerve grafting is a technique where you bridge a gap so you take a nerve, such as a nerve from the leg, a skin nerve, so there's very little uh, donor deficit from that, and you splice it in to repair the zone of injury. 
like a bridge. Uh, so that's a good uh, technique to use when you're trying to repair an injury that's still connected to the spinal cord. What also is available are newer techniques called nerve transfers where you can substitute another function for something that's not working. And what you do is you take something that's of less value and you move it to something that potentially is more valuable in an effort to recreate function. Now those, have, those techniques have been done primarily in the past for the injuries when the spinal nerves have been ruptured, uh, avulsed from the spinal cord. Because of the promising results with this technique, in fact they're being done to try to get results better even when the nerves are connected to the spinal cord in the hopes of speeding recovery by beating that inch a month, uh, so to speak. So what you can do is do a reconstruction closer to the muscle than typically is done when the injury is in the neck and you repair it in the neck. Finally, if one is trying to get hand function in someone who has a flail limb from a complete injury, for example, there are several new ways being done using a technique called a free muscle transfer. A free muscle transfer can be done at any time, but what you do is you take a muscle from another part of the body, such as a thigh muscle, and using microsurgical techniques, you can fix not only the nerve, but blood vessels, and have that new muscle uh, take over a new role, such as elbow flexion, or in this case, even finger flexion. But in the past, getting hand function back has been almost impossible with nerve surgery because of the great distance it is from the neck to the hand. These new techniques using free muscle transfer can creatively recreate ways of trying to get that kind of function back. Patients with brachial plexus injuries need to be followed for several years because recovery is so slow. Given the one inch a month, you can understand how these problems really take that time in order to show improvement. With physical therapy and recovery, oftentimes secondary type surgeries may be uh, in order. So for example, tendon transfers or soft tissue procedures and sometimes even bony fusions may be helpful in optimizing care for people uh, both primarily with nerve surgery, but secondarily with various other techniques in order to provide the best outcome. In general, outcomes are improving. The best outcomes are in the injuries that are less severe or in those that show early recovery. Uh, for those in which case surgery is indicated, the best results are for shoulder and elbow flexion. We prioritize elbow flexion because that really is the most important function in our opinion. But we're learning about more important functions such as uh, outward motion of the shoulder. Of course, everyone wants hand function back, especially those with the complete injuries. And unless you use pioneering approaches like the free muscle technique, uh, nerve surgery in general has been disappointing. So I think in summary, Many of these injuries are unfortunately uh, lifelong ones that are severe. Um, but I think with the various techniques and the various approaches that a multidisciplinary approach can offer, uh, there's no question that we can improve the functionality and pain in many patients providing useful uh, ability to return to work and to a lifestyle that's good. At Mayo Clinic, we have a multidisciplinary team of several members, not only in neurosurgery, but also in orthopedics and hand surgery. Uh, together, we work as a team in order to address the multiple different complex problems of patients with these types of injuries. The injuries transcend not only the neurologic loss, but in some cases, patients have severe unremitting pain, which is quite devastating as well. We have pain specialists and physiatrists, people who are interested in the physical therapy approach here as well. Physical therapy in combination with pain management and medications can often help some of the pain problems. Now physical therapy is an important part of the overall rehabilitative needs of these patients because oftentimes they can get quite stiff and develop contractures. 
So this multidisciplinary approach works well to the individual needs of the patient. At Mayo, we uh, deal with over 150 patients operatively each year, and I think in most series, uh, this kind of experience breeds better results than the people who do this on occasion. As far as research, there's multiple different avenues uh, that people are looking into in the basic science laboratory. I think one of the most exciting is by Thomas Carlstead and his group uh, now in England, where they're looking at re-implanting spinal nerves into the spinal cord. This has been a pioneering technique. It's still not available prime time in the United States, but I think in the future this is a technique uh, complemented by certain types of growth factors that may be very promising for people with, unfortunately, a lifelong problem.